Hello everyone. My name is Kevin Richardson. I am a senior user experience architect here at Infragistics and today I will be talking to you about the design process and its role in the creation of complex systems. Uh, you should be able to hear me now. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, because I don't have a lot of questions coming in that you can actually hear me. Uh, I posted to everyone before if there's a problem using the voice over IP, you can dial in directly using the number 1-800-747-1111. And the code is 448-2000. Thank you, everyone, for the messages. Um, once my presentation is finished, uh, figure 30 to 40 minutes, probably close to 40, um, then I will take questions via Q&A, uh, chat feature in live meeting. Feel free to enter those as we go along. When I'm finished, I'll go through, I'll try and enter as many as I can. Um, if I don't get to yours, feel free to email me uh, or contact me here via phone, and I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. Uh, you can include your email address with your question if you like, and I can get back to you that way. So to begin, uh, what I'd like to explore today is the idea that simply following existing software development methods, that it's entirely possible, in fact, probably uh, likely, to create systems that are neither useful nor intuitive, but that can meet usability guidelines. So. Let's talk about cars, houses, and software. I have here three pictures. I have an old Ford on the left. I have a picture of an old house on the right, and the picture of uh, a screen from SAP CRM module on the bottom. And my question to you is, which of these is not like the others? Right? Think old Sesame Street for those with that reference. Um, and Think about these three things for a minute. Cars, for example, began in the late 1800s. Cars they were first invented were uncomfortable, they were unreliable, they were dangerous, but they could go faster and farther than the existing transportation system of the day. They were quicker than horses. And even though if you owned a car, you had to be your own mechanic and you had to be able to make your own spare parts, it was enough, right? They were better than what you had. Houses, right, even older, if it kicks the wind and the rain off you, it's enough. It's better than the alternative. Software, I'm going to argue, is also As long as a piece of complex software has more features, it's enough. So, which of these three things is different? I'm going to argue that the software is different, but maybe for a different reason. I would argue that software of these three has not evolved. Cars have evolved, houses have evolved from engineering events to personal events. It is not enough that a car or a house simply do better than a horse or a cave, right? People won't buy those things. They won't be accepted. But software, it's enough. It's still enough. My point being here is that everything gets designed, but that software remains an engineering event. It's granted the result of countless 
well-meaning decisions. But we measure it by its features and its functionality rather than its usefulness. And what we're left with is exactly what it was meant to be. It was designed to be what it is. And, and why do we accept these things? Well, for a number of reasons, none of which should probably surprise anyone on the phone today. Um, a piece of software with a lower price point and a larger feature set is automatically considered to be better. So that makes an easy decision to go and tell your manager that we should purchase such and such a piece of software. Um, stakeholders, the people who are responsible for buying and installing software, especially large enterprise software systems, expect software to require changes to internal business processes and workflows. The expectation is there that we will, the people, the processes, flex to fit around an existing piece of software. And the cost of this poorly designed software, which may do lots of great things, is going to come later and, in all likelihood, be somebody else's problem. And for some reason, we allow software to be special. Would you accept any of these things for a car or house? Probably not. But software is somehow this special thing. So what I want to get across is that while everything gets designed, not everything gets designed well. Now, um, anybody who happened to notice my title here should be saying, but, but Kev, <laughs> you're a usability guy. We've got this bad piece of software. All right, we recognize it. Isn't it your job to make it better? And I'm going to answer that question by saying usability is not enough. Usability is not enough to fix software that has been designed poorly. We can improve software, but it's akin to treating the symptoms rather than the disease. So, for example, in this picture here, um, I can have usable features, I can have usable components, I can have usable functionality, all of which sound great, right? I can test these usability metrics, guidelines, and say, yep, these are all okay. I can give it my sign of approval. But when we combine these all into a single complex system, we discover that, hey, the user can't make sense of this. They can't the picture. It doesn't work well with my existing process. It doesn't work well with the other software programs that I'm using. So what I want to talk about for a moment now are three ways to approach the design of a new system. The first one I'm just going to call A, and this may sound very familiar to folks. And it's, and it's easy, right? First step, make a list. Somebody goes out and figures out what this new piece of software needs to have. Give me all of the new features you think you should have. Um, what functional updates does it need compared to my existing software? What things would be nice to have? And this is a role making this list, typically carried out by business analysts, stakeholders themselves, maybe marketing, depending on the organization and the software, right? What does the business want my next new piece of software to be able to developers? This puts the development organization in an extremely awful position. The developers now have to coordinate the requirements, they need to use their best judgment to design this system that coordinates, you know, new features, functional updates, um, their best attempt at usability, as well, believe it or not, to actually code this thing so that at the end of 
the development life cycle, there is something that's built that can be shown to the people who just paid for it. Now, one of many problems is that the design of this system is finished only when the development is finished. Right? We get this huge ta-da moment at the end that says, hey, this is what you guys want, right? Second approach is to include researchers. Uh, we're talking here about cognitive psychologists like me or human factors folks or information architects, maybe anthropologists, to do a better job of making the requirements list. These folks aren't simply going out to people in the field and saying, what do you want? I'll, you know, make a big long list. Um, but they're observing users, they're interviewing users, they're watching them as they work, they're looking at the, the physical environment, they're looking at the other pieces of software, the other applications that are being used, um, and they are coordinating user requirements with business requirements and technology requirements. Um, but in a sense, what we're really doing here is making a better list, right? We could be including wireframes. That's something that uh, usability folks typically do. Um, usability testing might be included in this. And maybe wireframes to developers, and the developers are still required to kind of use their best judgment required to do some design work on their own, and code. And again, here we kind of have the same problem, that the design is finished when development is finished. It is better than approach A, but it's not as good as we can do. The third approach here follows a product design process, and that's what I'm arguing needs to be more widely adopted by industry when we're talking about the design, the development, the creation of complex software. In this case, step one is researchers with designers, and designers are folks with a background in all sorts of area of design. Most importantly, process of research informed design, which is typically used for product development, to go out and together observe and interview users. And we're doing the same sorts of things here. We're looking at what users want and coordinating that with what we can infer users need, and then taking that list of requirements and coordinating it with business and tech. Then design, with help from research, create fast and inexpensive mock-ups. This is slightly different than the wireframes that I might create as a, you know, a long-term usability guy, um, because designers are trained in a process that allows them to explore innovative solutions, to create multiple designs, to address the same problem, such that we can test multiple alternatives to make sure that the thing is useful and usable before development begins. This also gives us the ability to gather team consensus on a set of high fidelity screens with user data that says, okay, you may or may not like this, but here's data that says people can and will use it successfully. That allows developers to focus on code, the thing they would like to focus on, rather than design and usability. What we're talking about here really is, you know, the right tool for the right job. The problem is that not enough companies do this, because here we've got design complete before development begins. And it allows folks like me to focus on the research aspect it allows design to create visual artifacts that address a set of requirements, 
and it allows development to bring those development uh, those those designs to life without the need to do things that take away from those tasks. What you get at the end of this is something that is innovative, intuitive, and useful. And I want to talk about an example here for a second. And my example is from uh, a visit I had to a former client of mine who was involved in trading. This is a picture, it's not of theirs, I just grabbed this off the web, but it, it, it's pretty uh, typical of, of your average trader's desktop. They've got multiple monitors kind of wrapped around their heads. There's a lot of, of line graphs, there's a lot of motion, there are things blinking. Um, usually there are a bit more spreadsheets up here than these pictures show. Um, but what I was doing there, I was being given a tour around by the, the guy in charge of the facility. And I was their, their best trader, and we shook hands. And I looked at the, the screens this guy was using, and they were just awful. They looked kind of like this. It was a lot of data, things blinking, rows and columns. Um, some were bigger than others, some were colorful, some were not, lots of line graphs. Um, and I thought no one, no one would choose to look at this sort of thing for eight to ten hours a day. Nobody. So I asked the guy in charge of the facility, who has control over the display on the screen here, figuring they must be getting a feed from someplace else. And he said, oh, no, we have complete control of everything that gets displayed on the screen. And I thought, all right, that's not the answer I expected. So I turned to the trader himself, and I said, well, if you could have anything, what would you want to make your job easier? And I assumed he would tell me something like, you know, make this stop blinking, make these graphs do something else, you know, something about the display of the information. And what he told me was surprising to say the least. He said, I want a faster processor in my computer. I said, really? <laughs> a faster processor? Why? He said, because then instead of having four screens, I could have six. I could have more data. It's, it would allow me to make better decisions, buy, sell, whatever, um, if I had quicker access to more data. And, and there, I think, is the, the key here. If I was simply going out and making a list, I could have stopped at this point and said, okay, we're done. I could have turned to the guy in charge of the facility and said, just buy everybody a faster processor, install a new piece of hardware, give everybody two new screens, boom, we're done. And you probably would have seen incremental improvement Adding more data to your average trader or your novice trader is going to make life much worse for them. But these guys might have shown incremental improvement, and that might have been enough to satisfy everybody. But the purpose of a product design, a research-informed design process, is not simply to walk around and ask people what they want. Because the truth is, people don't necessarily know what would allow them to do their jobs better. This is the difference between incremental improvement and true innovation. If I were to watch this trader and see how he makes decisions, what information he uses, what I would look at, and in fact what I saw, was that he takes a lot of data, for example, rate of change of currency to uh, previous rates of change, and maybe the rate of change of the rate of change. And he's looking at different tables to pull these numbers. And in his head, he's converting this data to information. So from his point of view, 
he needs quicker access to the data. From the design perspective, I can say, ah, what this guy really needs is the ability to, at a glance, compare current rate of change, say dollar compared to euro, to the rate of change of the rate of change compared to the rate of change of the rate of change from this time last quarter or whatever, right? For him, it would be easier in his head to do this using six different monitors. I can say, take this requirement, show me the rate of change, rate of change of the rate of change and historical rate of change, and ask design to give me three different ways of visualizing that data. And I can put that in front of this guy and say, what would you think if we gave you this? Or ask him to complete his task using this instead of half a dozen spreadsheets and see how well he does. That's when you start seeing not incremental but innovative um, improvement. Change that users themselves, stakeholders themselves, cannot visualize, but that a research-informed design process can enable. All right, so that's all great. We have this process of collecting requirements, of creating the visualization, of screen alternatives, visual artifacts, um, such that we can create a whole lot of great things that enable the developers to do um, uh, an easier job of, of what they want to do. But surely there must be something else, right? I've only been talking for 25 minutes, there must be something else. <laughs> so there is, obviously. And the question I want to explore for a moment now is, what if design, the process of design, could also decrease the risk and by association, the cost of software development. And here I'm going to ask you to indulge me in one more story. A tale of two Harrys. I don't know anybody out there familiar with Harry Potter or have kids who were growing up when the Harry Potter books were coming out. I happen to have two who were of the perfect age for Harry Potter. And they devoured these things, right? 600 page books. They were huge. They were done the next morning, four hours, nonstop. Don't eat, don't get up, just read it. Um, so the first few, I think it was the first three books had come out, and the kids loved them, right? And then, then suddenly, the we spend whatever it was, $40 on tickets, God knows how much on popcorn, candy, and soda, and we go in and we watch the film. We come out of the film, and I asked, all right, so, you know, what would you guys think of the movie? And they didn't like it. All right, they didn't like the movie. So I wasted $40, $50, $60, whatever it was. And, and I asked, well, why? You know, if you loved Harry Potter, why didn't you like the movie? And they said, not surprisingly, well, it wasn't the same as the book. And, and really what they're talking about, and what, what anybody talks about, when they've read the, the book version of a movie and then go see the, the screenplay version, is that it didn't match the movie they had in their head. So that when they came out, all they could talk about was, well, this didn't really happen in this book. That was kind of pulled from the second book. And, you know, Harry Potter didn't look like I expected him to look. And, you know... It, compared to the visualization they had in their head. And this is exactly the same process that happens in software development today. Let's go back to my uh, original A, B, and C processes from before. Um, you know, I, I go and I collect a lot of requirements. Usually these are prose-based. They're collected in a big book. They get passed around for approval. Everybody says, yep, you know, this software shall do this. This software will do that. Everybody agrees, signs off, boom, boom, boom. Development gets it. Six months later, everybody's invited back for an alpha release. 
the curtain is pulled back, ta-da! And everybody in the room either silently or not so silently says, this is what I asked for? It, you know, this isn't what I was expecting. It doesn't look like I expected it to look. To which the answer is always, but it does all the things you want it to do. Yeah, but it doesn't really do them the way I thought it would do them in my head. Well, it meets the requirements. That's what we're looking at here. So I have a couple of examples. I have one here for waterfall. I have one for, for agile, rapid development design, uh, development process, um, and then one for product design. And please don't take this line as being, you know, the red risk line as being indicative of absolute numbers. Just think of it in terms of, of trends. Um, and, and the software development process here follows uh, a nicely laid out process. You know, we start out with requirements. What should the software do? It's my nice big book. We start building from that. Uh, we have some alpha release, internal validation, external validation, UAT. Um, we roll it out, soft release, hard release. And what happens is, when we begin, everybody's happy. Risk is low. And as the requirements get collected as development begins, risk increases. As soon as we kind of pull the covers back from this thing the first time, it is as risky as it can be because now people are dissatisfied. This is the first time I'm seeing it. Now we have to make changes. Um, and with risk comes expense. Agile was an attempt to, to mitigate this through the use of quick sprints. And while I would agree it does lower risk, it doesn't eliminate it certainly, and that trend of increasing risk remains because while I may be able to view and comment on individual components as they're completed in sprint one, sprint two, sprint three, I don't see this thing put together in its totality until it's finished. And at that point, it becomes very difficult to change. And it's very difficult to understand what that end point will look like simply by viewing piece parts along the way. You know, it's hard to know what the house will look like if I only see the stairs and the upstairs bedroom. Product design which has been around for centuries, is an attempt to mitigate risk, to minimize risk, such that, you know, risk is at its highest when we don't know what the thing will look like. And through our collection of requirements, which we can improve upon by coordinating the talents of researchers and designers, we can continue to minimize risk through early pen and paper concepts, visual modeling, iterative testing, such that by the time we're ready to code, everybody knows what this thing will look like in the end. Everybody should be satisfied that users can and will use this thing in the end, that it will function in a cooperative fashion with other applications that are in the environment. And while it won't eliminate risk, it will minimize it. It will do a better job of mitigating it than certainly Agile does. So what is design? Design is a process. It's that gap that gets bridged between business and tech and the requirements of people. It's mindful of features. It's mindful of functions. It's also mindful of legacy systems. Design never happens in a vacuum. That would be bad design. And it's also an understanding of who uses where it is used. And also, most importantly, 
not only what users need, but what users need to accomplish. And that's where that better way of collecting requirements becomes very important. It's also an exploration of different interaction models that designers are taught how to do. And then for usability, it's fast, early, and iterative validation. It's the coordination of these things. It's the right tools for the right job. So earlier I said not everything gets designed well. And the answer to, well, what does it mean to be well designed is that something needs to be well designed. Um, you know, a well designed system should be beautiful and lasting, it should be usable and intuitive, it should be innovative and inspiring. Obviously, it needs to be scalable and supportable. And it needs to be more than simple incremental improvement. So ask yourself. Looking at that screen I had uh, earlier in the beginning, the SAP um, module screen, doesn't seem to fit these things. Maybe it's scalable. Maybe it's supportable. It's certainly not innovative or inspiring. It might be usable, but I've actually done some testing on that sort of stuff, and it's, it's oftentimes not. Um, it's not intuitive. It's certainly not beautiful. And my guess is it's not going to last either. So what is good design? Good design is a research-based iterative process that discovers and defines requirements centered around what users need to accomplish. Design is the artifact, the screens, the interaction models are replaced by the task. When I'm no longer fighting the system, but able to do what I need to do in a way that makes the system transparent is when you know you have good design. Thank you very much. Um, I am looking at Q&A questions now, if anybody has any. Hopefully folks can still hear me. A couple of questions coming in now. Um, question whether or not the presentation will be available. I believe the answer to that question is yes. Um, I do have our marketing team here. I don't know uh, where they will make that available on the website. If you would like to send me an email with that question and your interest in seeing this presentation later, I will pass that on to marketing. Other ones. There's a question. Uh, can I please go back over the software design slide? Uh, the software design slide. I can do that. Just a moment. I have two software design slides. Um, both of which look at how this is a process. Um, I will argue that risk increases during waterfall until we get to the point of the alpha release, at which point it uh, then becomes a process of trying to manage a high level of risk. For agile, the overall level of risk, I think, is lowered, but it still increases from when the project begins to when the proof of concept is available 
at which point we have the same problem again. It's uh, a process of managing that existing level of risk. Uh, question here, have you seen any instances where your design methodology was merged with agile software development successfully? Um, and the answer to that is, is yes. Um, the, the role of design is sometimes not to do kind of define the process, although I would argue vehemently that the product design process is better than the agile software development process, but it is possible to coordinate the two of them. Um, it requires enough time up front to allow, really, the design process to be completed, or at least well on its way, so that we have a good idea of what the final system will look like, will feel like, will act like, before we begin, begin the sprint. It's almost like a sprint zero. Um, so that what we're starting with is not an incomplete set of requirements that we're going to fill in along the way, but we have a complete set of requirements before we begin, and then we can pick and choose what to build from those requirements in each sprint. Uh, here's an interesting question. Design is not black and white, so how do you mitigate emotions of a client and the design team? Um, let me address the client part first. Um, emotions of the client, yes, every client looks at designs and says, ooh, I like these, ooh, I like those. You know, oh, I don't like that color or that font. Um, the way I have seen it work most successfully in the past is to begin by using low-fidelity wireframes these don't necessarily need to be hand-drawn sketches, but they can be um, Visio or Photoshop or, you know, Balsamic, any number of other tools. Um, we have a tool here at Infogistics called Indigo Studio, which you may have seen uh, announced in the past couple of days. That's also good. So that we focus not on font, not on content, not on color, not on iconography, but on layout on information architecture on proposed interaction model choice so that we try and keep clients as focused on the objective as opposed to the subjective as possible. At that point we have usually some early usability data um, and then at at the far end of that spectrum when we're talking about visual design, aesthetics, you know, imagery, those sorts of treatments, um, there, since we already know that our, the bones, the structure of our design is um, usable and useful and agreed to, those decisions become less project shattering. Um, a couple more questions here. Uh, let me scroll down to the bottom. One at random. This is an interesting question. Uh, why do you say that design has to be beautiful? What do you mean by beautiful? Um, obviously, beautiful is a subjective term, um, but there is no need for software to make the user shudder in its apparent complexity. Software, like anything, can be visually appealing. And that's what I'm talking about here. I should be able to look at a piece of software and feel as though I can use it, feel as though I am its equal that I can not necessarily need months of training, that it's not going to look like, um, you know, my life is going to be hellish for the next however period of time while I try and figure out how to use this thing. Uh, 
Uh, here's a question. On the very first slide, you have a screen that you later identified as not well designed. Wish to see an example of a transparent, well designed screen. A fair question. Um, let me take a note of that. I have an example of poor design, but I don't actually have an example of something that I would consider good design. I don't have one here right in front of me, but I will incorporate that um, before out to the general public if I can. Um, in the meantime, know that if I do this presentation again, I will include that. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Here's a question. What is the way forward for organizations without dedicated design resources? Is this the only answer hiring design professionals, or are there beneficial ways to incrementally transform the way that an organization delivers software? Um, and yes, I understand that most large companies, most small companies, in fact, will not have designers on staff, may not have any sort of research background folks on staff, usability human factors. Um, one easy and shameless plug is to say, well, there are organizations out there like Infragistics uh, that do offer this as a service. But barring hiring uh, an organization uh, in a contract role, um, can you try and follow this process? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are ways of going out and collecting requirements, being more like a researcher, cog psych, anthropology. Books out there to kind of get an idea of how requirements should be collected. Um, there is no secret to trying to create multiple visual models that might satisfy your requirements. Uh, usability testing is something that is teachable, that is learnable. Also something that kind of in isolation can be um, contracted out. Um, but the process here the product design process that I'm describing um, can be followed by anyone. And you know you're not following it if you start trying to lay out screens around a conference table as everybody is talking about what they want their piece of software to do. That's wrong. Um, here's a question. Uh, is it good to consider the color blindness in the design part? If so, then which color would you prefer? Uh, obviously, there are the guys color blindness, um, being aware of people with certain color deficiencies. Um, or actions simply based on color alone. You can uh, almost always include a label with color, knowing that color may not be distinctive. Um, there are free tools out there, both on the web as well as on mobile devices, that allow you to see what your screens will look like to people with uh, red, green, or blue, yellow color deficiencies. Those are the, the, the two common ones, uh, mostly for men. Um, true color blindness is very rare. That's not something, something most software developers need to be concerned about. Uh, there's a lot to, uh, to look at how your application will appear to those folks. Here's a question from Kurt. How iterative do you do the concept design before going into coding? With Agile, how much design do you lock down and how much do you allow to be flexible? Um, I would expect that a good 80 plus percent 
of the design is determined before coding begins. At a minimum, you can determine the interaction models that are used to allow people to accomplish the key tasks. You can determine the key screen types and then use that as the best for uh, of who your key user types are and what interaction models you will use to allow those people to accomplish those tasks. Certainly there's always room for some flexibility um, and even in the most completely designed system, I have always seen changes that come about in development. Um, some that change design because the development team might not be able to, to understand how to code a certain feature. Um, sometimes because development comes back with an idea that design and research didn't consider because we didn't know. Um, and, and maybe something that I left out earlier is that I don't expect that research and design to be doing their thing off on their own and then simply development maybe at some small level of participation needs to keep involved as maybe less so during the research phase but more so during the design phase to make sure that they have input into things that are being designed, that they have the ability to make comments and suggestions, that they are part of that process itself, so that we aren't simply throwing something over the wall. And my apologies if I suggested that. Uh, here's an interesting comment. How should we take the information you've given us and use it going forward? Um, well, what I would like to say is that you look at your existing requirements gathering, wireframing development process and see how far it is different. What is the delta between your existing process and the process I described here? And then try and minimize those differences. If you can do one thing, maybe you try and make it such that your requirements gathering process is improved. If you're simply given the requirements, maybe you can improve your design phase. Um, if you're given designs and simply asked to code, Maybe you can at least keep these sorts of things in mind and ask the sorts of questions that say, yeah, but it doesn't make sense for the user to be doing this this way here and doing this that way there. What, what are they trying to accomplish? And maybe we can combine some of these bits of functionality to make something that helps them do that rather than simply say, well, it's in there, you know, it's in the top navigation and they just have to go and look at the different pieces and put them together themselves. Uh, let me look down a little bit. Uh, here's a question. Helen, what are your favorite mock-up tools? Um, I have used Visio in the past. I have used Balsamic in the past. I have used uh, Infragistics Indigo Studio in the past. Not being a designer by training, I don't typically use Photoshop or InDesign, but I have seen designers who work solely in those two mediums. Um, honestly, I find that the very best way to begin, believe it or not, is with pencil and paper. There are some really nice free um, PDFs out there on the, uh, on the web that allow you to print out for yourself a nice uh, graph paper in the shape of 
monitors at different resolutions of different handheld devices, different tablets, but even just taking a blank piece of paper, sketching things out, and taping them to the wall so that it's easy to step back and see how a user would flow through your application, I find as being the best way to begin. And just a few more questions. Uh, for the person who was asking, are we still on slide 14? Sorry about that. Yeah, I have slide 14 up only because that's where I was um, when I was finished. There we go. Uh, I don't have any uh, video. That's probably the same slide 14 question. It's a question from Ed. If my organization has an institutional life cycle process that is basically waterfall, how do I move? A new design process. Uh, it's a challenge that I have spent most of my career trying to do. So it's not an easy thing to take an existing development process or an organization that has become centered around an existing development process and to change that. Um, my very pragmatic suggestion is that you attempt to provide your development organization with things that make their life easier. And the product design process really is making life easier for development, right? It is allowing development to focus on what they're good at, at what they like to do, at what they would prefer to focus on, which is developing. Right? If I'm a developer and I have to worry about designing a screen, well, that's not comfortable for me. That's not my area of expertise. I may not have any inclination to do that work. Um, I would much rather worry about how to solve a particular design problem than to create the design and then develop it. Uh, the question, is it possible for developers to retrain to perform software design for one's company and if so, what type of training is possible? Actually, that brings up an interesting point. Um, in part, the way I see the direction of my field or the field of, of design going, at least in terms of, of complex software, um, I see more and more people with training in multiple disciplines, maybe a focus more in one The future is going to be driven by people with multiple skill sets. Um, if you are a developer with, you know, think think in terms of university, in terms of college, you know, you have a major and a minor. If, if development is your major, but design is your minor, or research is your minor, that will only allow you to be better at your job, if only because it allows you to understand the particular languages spoken by the individual disciplines. Developers speak a language. Research speaks a language. Design speaks a language. The more familiarity you have with disciplines outside your own, the easier it is to communicate. And that ability to translate, that ability to communicate, is really key. I see more and more people coming out of design programs that have a research background. I see designers, uh, researchers coming out of, of research programs with design backgrounds. I'm seeing. more developers um, with research backgrounds. Those two things seem to go together. Um, and obviously, there are designers who develop for themselves. I think folks each have a strength and maybe a natural interest, inclination, a proclivity. Um, but 
the better you are able to bridge the divides between the disciplines, the better off you will be. Um, is there training in these things? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are conferences, there are symposiums, um, there is training, in fact, offered by external companies. Infragistics offers training in, in usability research and design. Um, there's a Human Factors International, which actually offers a, uh, a course or a series of classes um, in human factors, these sorts of things. Yeah, you can go and do that. Uh, we have to get to one more question. Here's one, Dimitri. Beyond the visual aspects of software design, there is still a need to define the architecture of the software itself. For example, what design pattern to choose, what components will constitute it. So the software engineer still needs to design how usability translates to actual lines of code, no? Or does the visual design map also to the software architecture? Um, oh, maybe I answered this before. Um, but there is a role for research and design to determine the architecture from the user's point of view. Um, but obviously, those two groups need to work together with software design to understand the development impact of those research and design decisions such that we are not recommending a solution that would be difficult to, to code or maybe difficult to maintain um, or difficult to coordinate with, with other applications. Um, so at that point, it really does need to be a bit of a group effort. Um, all right, we have a couple of minutes before the hour. I appreciate everyone who has listened to me this afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. I hope I was able to provide something of value to you. Um, do please, if you want to continue this conversation, uh, my address, my email is here on the slide, krichardson at infragistics.com. I'm more than happy to talk to you. Um, and maybe we will meet again in the future. Thank you very much. And